is your research focus? Yeah, so my lab um, focuses on synapses. So synapses are these very small um, sites of um, information transfer and processing between neurons. And um, though they're, they're very small, they're very important to deeper understand um, these, these structures because um, they do very interesting jobs. I mean, they sort of um, transform information in terms of their um, um, information content. And um, they're very different from ordinary sort of like communication sites of our cells, also by their speed. I mean, they can sort of operate um, in the information process up to like um, um, tens of, of hertz from individual um, little synaptic site. And so um, there must be something in there actually which allows these structures to be of this ultimate speed when they come to um, their, their function. And it uh, was for a long time unknown um, by what means actually they, they, they can operate um, with um, such fidelity but um, um, in a highly controlled manner. And um, it then turned out that actually um, they are composed of very organized um, protein architectures which allow them to attract um, synaptic vesicles um, in a very efficient way and also allows them to be controlled in a, in a, in a very sophisticated manner. And it is about these protein architectures which is in the size regime of something like typically 100 nanometers and below um, where we um, actually um, are mostly working on to understand how synapses work in a generic manner but also to understand how synapses um, actually get um, diversified in our brains. So what impact does super resolution microscopy have for your studies? Okay, yeah well I said these structures are very small. I mean they're like um, typically um, something like uh, at best 200 nanometers in diameter. Um, and um, Ultimately, we want to get really a rich picture um, of um, how that um, protein architectures within such individual synaptic sites look like. In terms of um, technology, um, there is on one hand the tradition of um, electron microscopy for these structures. However, electron microscopy certainly um, we cannot um, apply in any uh, live manner. And um, it is often very laborious and often not productive trying to do um, immunoelectron microscopy on these structures. On the other hand, also um, electron microscopy um, allows us only to look in a very limited sort of like um, number of um, examples. And there, um, with the advent of super resolution light microscopy, we're getting a tool at hand which um, in application um, is simple and um, often allows us to use the very same antibodies which we use for standard immunofluorescent stainings also for the super resolution um, um, experiment and brings us exactly in the size domain where we want to ask our question which means in this range what we like to call the mesoscale something in between few tens of nanometers to like um, uh, 100 nanometer that's exactly the region where um, or this sort of like size regime where the questions are we want to answer and this is where super resolution brings us. So it's in, in, in a way for us um, um, an ideal tool. Did you get any new insights from super resolution microscopy? Yeah, yeah we, we, we definitely learned. I mean, by super resolution microscopy, so it goes back to like 2005 roughly when we had identified a first major um, component of these protein architectures I, I spoke about, uh, a name which got this bizarre name, um, Bruchpilot or short BRP. And um, though we were very ex excited about finding that protein, we would not know um, how that protein would really contribute um, to um, structuring the, the very synapse. And then with like, getting access um, to, in that case, that microscopy, we really learned that it um, has a very um, special and defined um, sort of like a distribution within the active zone and sort of um, with um, these um, kind of like approaches we could really work out how that protein shapes and integrates um, into that very protein architecture and so we could deeper understand uh, why it is that these kind of proteins play such a big role if it comes to the information um, processing at synapses, how they can uh, sort of like actively 
um, attract synaptic vesicles and guide them to their place of fusion. Static techniques you are using are quite advanced. Are there still some challenges using these techniques? Well, I mean, <laughs> for having for interesting science, there's always um, challenges, um, um, sure enough. Let me say, I mean, one, one, one big challenge in a deeper description of these structures is, on one hand, the optics, I mean, to get um, ever better resolution, but it's only one thing. I mean, the other thing is definitely in the sort of like detection of your epitopes. Means like um, in preparing the probes, which allow you to, to actually do super resolution. And there we are investing into um, um, a lot of into antibodies, actually, which allow us a very high labeling density in order to really uh, make use of the resolution which we have at hand um, with um, STAT. And the other very big challenge, where we're just, just sort of like um, um, in the middle of it, is to also um, apply um, STAT microscopy to the live intact organism. We're kind of fortunate there because the, our um, object is Drosophila larvae, which um, are, ve are very well suited for um, in vivo, or as we say, intravital imaging. So they, um, you can put them in an oil phase and then these larvae become wonderfully transparent and we can sort of like look with um, ideal optics into these larvae. And so we've been starting um, a couple of years back to do also live stat on them. And now, um, with the advent of time gating, um, we're getting the impression that now working on the very functional molecules of a synapse in a live fashion becomes more and more reality. Certainly, we're, we're, uh, as everybody here, um, facing um, bleaching as a major obstacle. But as said, with the, um, with the advent of time gating, we're getting um, better in that. And our, um, our feel is that um, we're pretty much there to also get um, a first deeper understanding how over time these molecules actually organize and by what um, dynamics they exchange and how plastic these architectures are. So how would you rate the future significance of super resolution microscopy for life science? Yeah. Um, so I, I think um, that the community, I mean, I'm talking particularly also cell biology, has maybe not yet fully understood, I think, I mean, the, um, the um, big advantages and the, um, the new pictures, <laughs> which, which are possible. Um, and I think um, ultimately um, what super resolution should be able to do is that it, all, it will really speak about proximity um, relations of proteins in a size range of only a couple of nanometers, which means that in a way will replace a classical biochemical um, probing by optical probing, which will tell us that yes, two proteins of standard size are in a certain um, um, proximity relation, which likely means they're, they're part of one complex. So I, I, I'm not saying that um, super resolution light microscopy is going to sort of like um, make biochemistry superfluous, but I'm saying um, that we will be able to read out um, um, protein uh, relations um, to a degree which was in former times really the uh, domain of only biochemical um, um, or access. So you have been one of the first users of our STAT systems. What are your experiences with Leica Microsystems as a collaboration partner? Yeah, well I, I, I fairly can say or frankly can say that, um, that we um, uh, definitely overall had a very good relation or still have with Leica. It is that we were between the first ones also to get the, um, in, uh, in quotes, um, old system with um, the um, Titan Suffer um, system, um, which we installed something like in 2007, roughly, um, which was, so to say, the first commercial microscope and which in our hand would also um, work um, robustly. And I, I must say we, we were always in very um, intense um, Exchange. Um, we got um, quite a help from Leica. We uh, we think we could maybe also add here and there um, comment um, in an interesting fashion for Leica on our experiences. Um, so we had a, a, a continuous um, exchange actually um, of our um, of our experiences and, um, and of our protocols over the years. And um, 
So I would describe it as a fruitful uh, collaboration from both sides. I mean, it is that one of our former students, um, Werner Fouquet, is now as an application specialist with Leica. Um, and um, though maybe in the very first moment I wasn't super happy with uh, Werner to go, retrospectively I should say that I think it was a good solution for all sides because uh, Werner is, is a great guy and is a good, um, uh, <laughs> so to say, like a uh, catch for, for Leica. But on the other hand, uh, we have a wonderful contact to Werner also and other people there in the applications. and. That's that's a that's a very intense, very fair, very sort of like academic style exchange, which um, is good for all sides. No, I would describe it as very positive. Well, thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. <laughs>